A 200-ton steel giant must rise 1,000 feet above the city, but no crane on Earth can simply hoist it there. This is the fundamental engineering problem at the heart of every super tall skyscraper. For a tower to reach the clouds, it needs a crane, but the logistical challenge seems impossible. How do you erect the crane itself when you can't just call a bigger one? This practical limitation once constrained how high we could build, as early methods like Derrick's were far less efficient. The solution wasn't a more powerful machine, but a smarter one an engineering breakthrough that allows the crane to methodically climb its own structure as it grows. It's a system that relies on immense hydraulic power and pinpoint precision, where hundreds of tons are balanced in mid-air with zero margin for error. The consequences of a single miscalculation are catastrophic. But when executed correctly, this process unlocks the ability to build at almost any scale, defining the skylines we see today. This is Hard Hat Industries, where heavy machinery comes alive. Before a tower crane can begin its epic journey into the clouds, it demands an unbreakable connection to the ground below. This isn't just a simple slab of concrete, it's a colossal feat of engineering in its own right, built to withstand the astronomical forces the crane will exert on it. The process kicks off months before the crane even arrives on the bustling site, a massive pit is meticulously excavated, and into it, engineers construct a steel-reinforced concrete base that can weigh over 400 short tons, about 800,000 pounds of concrete and rebar combined. This foundation, often dozens of feet deep, is typically poured in a single continuous operation to ensure its unyielding structural integrity remains intact. This isn't just overkill, it's physics in action. A fully erected tower crane, with its long jib and heavy counterweights, functions as a massive lever. The forces at its base are immense, not just from the dead weight of the steel, but from the dynamic loads it lifts and the incredible torque generated by high-altitude winds relentlessly pushing against its towering mast. A flaw in this foundation, a miscalculation in the concrete mix, or improper curing, could spark catastrophic failure, toppling the crane from its base upward. Once the foundation is firmly set, the initial assembly begins in earnest. Using large mobile cranes, skilled crews install the first few sections of the mast. These base sections are anchored directly into the foundation using enormous, high tensile steel bolts, each torqued to precise specifications to ensure stability. This initial stack, maybe 50 to 100 feet high, forms the rigid spine upon which everything else will be built but this is as far as the mobile cranes can take it. The crane is now on its own, a lonely steel tower standing tall in the middle of a sprawling worksite. It has its anchor, but the real challenge is just beginning to unfold. How does it rise from this starter set to dominate the skyline? For the guys who've poured their sweat into these foundations, we want to hear your stories. What's the most challenging concrete pour you've been a part of? Share the gritty details in the comments below. This is the heart of the matter, the solution to the great skyscraper paradox. A tower crane doesn't get taller by being built from the outside, it grows from within. The key to this mechanical magic is a piece of equipment known as the climbing frame, or climbing cassette. This is a large, box-like steel structure that hydraulically surrounds the main mast, sitting just below the crane's turntable, the slewing unit that allows the jib to rotate. The process of jumping or climbing the crane is one of the most tense and carefully orchestrated events on any high-rise construction site. First, the crane's own hook is used to lift a new mast section from the ground. This new piece, typically weighing several tons and measuring about 20 feet in length, is maneuvered to the base of the climbing frame. Then, the real show begins. Powerful hydraulic rams within the climbing frame engage. With thousands of pounds per square inch of pressure, they push against the already built mast, lifting the entire top assembly of the crane, the turntable, the operator's cab, the jib, and the massive concrete counterweights, totaling over 150 tons. We're talking about a colossal combined weight being jacked up 20 feet into the air. As the entire upper section of the crane rises, a gap opens up within the climbing frame. Into this void, 
The new mast section is carefully slid into place and aligned. Massive steel pins and bolts are then driven home, securing the new section to the one below it and to the climbing frame above. The hydraulics are retracted, the load is transferred to the newly installed section, and just like that, the crane is 20 feet taller. This process is repeated again and again, allowing the crane to grow in lockstep with the building and eventually to surpass it. Each jump is a ballet of force and precision. For the operator in the cab, it's a strange sensation, a slow, groaning ascent as their entire workplace is lifted higher into the sky. This self-climbing technology is what makes modern megastructures possible. Without it, we would have hit a height limit in the skyscraper era. It's not just about building one skyscraper, it's the core technology that allows human ambition to keep reaching upward. For the operators out there, have you ever been in a crane during a jump? Describe what that feels like. Is it as nerve-wracking as it sounds? A steel tower soaring a thousand feet or more into the sky presents a massive problem. Wind. Even on a calm day at ground level, the winds at that altitude can be fierce and unpredictable. A freestanding tower crane is incredibly vulnerable and becomes dangerously unstable after rising beyond its maximum freestanding height, usually two to three hundred feet. To climb any higher, it needs a lifeline, a physical attachment to the very structure it is creating. This is done using what are known as tie-ins. These are heavy-duty steel support frames connecting the crane's mass directly to the building's structural skeleton. Every 10 to 20 floors, a new tie-in is installed. A horizontal steel collar is bolted around the mast, and from this, steel struts angle down to connect to the building's reinforced concrete floor slabs. These ties forge the crane and the building into a single, symbiotic structure. The building provides stability against immense wind loads, and the crane provides the lifting power to grow. This process introduces its own moments of tension. Before a crane can jump higher, its top tie-in must be removed, leaving it temporarily exposed. During these periods, crews monitor weather with extreme vigilance. The forces are staggering. A high wind can exert tens of thousands of pounds of force. Without these periodic anchors, the crane would buckle or topple. But this solution creates a new, complex problem. When the job is done, how do you remove a crane that's physically bolted into the finished skyscraper? What's the highest wind speed you've ever seen a tower crane rated to operate in? We've all seen the weather vane in a storm, but what's the real world limit? Share your knowledge below. Getting the crane up was a marvel of self-construction, but getting it down is a masterclass in planned deconstruction. The crane is now stranded a thousand feet in the air, its primary job complete with no external crane able to practically reach it. The solution is as methodical as it is brilliant, like watching a set of Russian nesting dolls in reverse. The main crane begins the process by dismantling itself. Using its own hook, it lowers sections of its own mast, piece by piece, to the ground until it's as short as it can possibly be while still anchored to the roof. But now, it's trapped. To solve this, a much smaller recovery crane, or derrick, is brought up to the roof, its components small enough to fit inside a freight elevator and is assembled by hand. This smaller derrick then dismantles the remaining pieces of the main tower crane, lowering the cab, turntable, and final mass sections to the ground. Now, the recovery crate is stranded, so an even smaller derrick is brought up and assembled to dismantle the first one. This process repeats until the last components are small and light enough for a crew of iron workers to take them apart by hand and carry them down the freight elevator. It's a quiet, meticulous retreat that stands in stark contrast to the brute force of construction. It is the final, elegant answer to the paradox we started with. The giant gracefully takes itself apart with help from its smaller descendants, vanishing from the skyline it helps create. Have you ever seen this dismantling process up close? What's the most ingenious problem solving you've witnessed on a job site to get heavy equipment out of a tight spot? From the skyscraper paradox to the massive anchor, the incredible self-climbing mechanism and the clever nested dismantling the journey of the tower crane is a testament to raw power guided by human ingenuity. 
It's a machine that solves an impossible problem by becoming the solution itself. Thanks for watching Hard Hat Industries, your source for serious machines doing real work. If you like this, hit like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you don't miss what's next. Until then, keep your head down and your gear running.